Welcome everyone to this special Zoom event to mark the publication of the revised edition of Confessions of a Heretic by Roger Scruton. My name is Rosalind Porter and I'm the publisher of Notting Hill Editions. And as you all know, Sir Roger Scruton was widely seen as one of the most respected philosophers of our time, whose often provocative views never failed to stimulate debate. In this brilliant collection of 12 essays, each one confesses an aspect of Scruton's thinking on subjects diverse as the right way to govern, lying, social media, the importance of nation states, the environment and architecture. I say confesses because many opinions expressed in this book are opinions that some of Scruton's critics would probably have advised him to keep to himself. Scruton's views, as we all know, often went against the tide, and yet people on both ends of the political spectrum gravitated towards him. About a year ago, we noticed that sales of our first edition of Confessions of a Heretic suddenly increased, and we assumed that readers had begun turning to Scruton at a moment when our politics seemed to divide us and define us. At such moments, reading Scruton feels essential. In conversation today to talk about Scruton's legacy, our Fisher Dedarian, Executive Director of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation, and political commentary Douglas Murray, who has written an introduction to the book. Fisher met Sir Roger as a student in his MA philosophy program at the University of Buckingham, and the idea for the foundation was subsequently conceived at a tutorial with Sir Roger. The mission of the foundation is to establish the legacy of Sir Roger Scruton through the hosting and sponsoring of events, lectures, seminars, research, and projects that are dedicated to the achievements of Western philosophy, architecture, art, and literature. Douglas Murray is a journalist and political commentary and the best-selling author of six books, including The Strange Death of Europe and, most recently, The Madness of Crowds, which was chosen as a book of the year by both The Times and The Sunday Times here in the UK. He is associate editor of The Spectator and is a regular contributor to numerous publications, including The Telegraph, The Times, The Mail on Sunday, and The National Review. A prolific debater, Murray has also appeared on most of the top political debate programs, including Newsnight, Daily Politics, and Question Time. Thank you so much for being here to discuss this incredible book and this incredible thinker. I'll now hand you over to Fisher. Thank you so much, Roz. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. And it's, uh, you know, for me, strange to be on this side of the screen, uh, or rather this side of the events, as I typically uh, introduce these things, given the foundation hosts them. But uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about today's conversation. Uh, thank you, Roz. And thank you, Kim Kramer, who is the managing director at Notting Hill Editions, who have put out this lovely revised edition. I don't know if any of you uh, watching today have seen the, uh, the book itself, but it's just a beautiful uh, cover, as is the first edition itself, um, but a wonderful uh, overview, I think, of, of Roger's work, uh, 12 essays in total, giving different tidbits, I think, and, and insights into what it is Roger thinks on a number of, of different topics, as, as Rosalind mentioned, uh, whether it's architecture or the environment uh, or uh, music or beauty or, or many other things that I hope to, uh, to get in today uh, in our discussion uh, with Douglas. So Douglas, I invite you to, uh, to join me on screen. And before we get started here, I do want to mention that we will be taking audience questions. I hope for the, uh, the, the final third of this uh, broadcast, we might have audience questions. So please uh, feel free to submit them to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, you know, depending on, on what you're on, as we would love to, uh, to take them. And, and uh, I'd love to ask Douglas some of these questions from you uh, beyond my own questions for him. But with that, Douglas, let's, uh, let's get into it. So obviously we know uh, Roger uh, is confessing as a heretic in some sense. I don't think it's necessarily his religious beliefs, even though he did in, in some way have uh, some unorthodox religious beliefs, uh, but more so uh, being a heretic of the accepted uh, positions in society, perhaps the politically correct ones, and, and very much so throughout his entire life. So to, to get us started here, Douglas, I, I thought you might uh, say a bit about Roger the heretic and highlight some of these uh, key and pivotal moments uh, in his life that helped him realize he really was on the outside and indeed a heretic uh, to much of, of modern society. Well, first of all, thank you, Fisher. Uh, thank you to the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. And thank you to Rosalind and, and Kim Notting Hill Editions. It's, it's a huge uh, honor as well as a great pleasure uh, to have been asked to write a new introduction to this revised edition of Confessions of a Heretic. And uh, I'm delighted to hear that it's already in a second printing. Um, 
the I read the book uh, when it first came out some five or so years ago, and it was a great pleasure, very moving to reread it uh, in the last year in, uh, in the wake of Roger's death, obviously, and uh, to revisit his thoughts on, as you say, Fisher, a very wide range of subjects, which which we'll get onto. Mm-hmm. Uh, as for that title and, and, and the particular term heretic, you're right, it's not necessarily a term you would immediately assume uh, or attach to uh, Roger Scruton. Um, but of course, there's a very obvious reason that he chose the term to describe himself, slightly tongue in cheek, perhaps, but with some uh, serious intent, because, of course, heretics um, are defined by the era that they emerge in. Uh, um, depending on what the prevailing ethos of the era is, uh, you can determine what an heretic would be in that uh, era. And the prevailing ethos in the era that Roger Scruton was working in was, uh, as he said himself many times, and I I think it's uh, pretty incontestable, uh, the the main ethic was uh, the ethos in the public square was a a left-wing ethos. Right. Uh, as I say in the introduction, there's of course a, um, a number of paradoxes within this. Uh, uh, Roger Scruton first came to prominence in in the 1980s, and uh, students of what we regrettably now have to call history uh, will notice that the 1980s was a time when a Conservative government was certainly in power in the UK as well as in the US. So uh, there might be a critique of people saying, well, how on earth could you be a heretic? Uh, when the conservative government of the era is uh, is of the right. And I think that this is um, a very interesting question. Uh, the answer I would submit is this, is that although it is true that conservative governments were in power in the 1980s when Roger first came to prominence, nevertheless, they effectively uh, won, and this has been said by other people as well, won the economic arguments and gave up the cultural ones. Uh, And you still see this in the legacy of um, conservative thinkers on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, There's a great uh, number of uh, free market think tanks and others who do work on economics, uh, but very little still uh, that concerns itself with the culture, with the wider culture. Well, that was always something that concerned Roger Scruton. And on a range of issues uh, throughout his life, he found himself in an unpopular position precisely because he was on the right in an era even when the right was in power. Um, because the, the concerns he had and the questions he um, addressed throughout his writings uh, were ones which were unpopular for conservatives to address. Uh, he, he, furthermore, I should add, it's a long answer, but he, he obviously felt like, if not a heretic, then certainly an outsider throughout these years as he said in a number of his books and on the record a number of times, as well as in private, he felt that after he published his book, The Meaning of Conservatism in 1980, he became effectively unemployable in uh, the academy and the universities, which in, in many ways ought to have been the place where he uh, consistently had his career. Uh, latterly, he did return in visiting capacities to a number of universities. But after The Meaning of Conservatism was published, he became aware that there was no way that he was going to be able to carve out his career within the university system, and so had to go it alone. And uh, I think in that situation, he certainly did feel that he was rowing against the tide. Uh, the columns he wrote in the 1980s for The Times, I think, somewhat enforced that feeling. And as you know, Fisher, from knowing him, there was always a sort of beleaguredness about him, uh, um, a slight uh, weariness and perhaps wariness that comes from having rowed against so many uh, tides. Um, So I think that's why he he used this term heretic. It is slightly tongue in cheek, but it's also something that does reveal a truth about him as a person and how he actually viewed himself. Absolutely. Well, and to your point, you know, you say, uh... He, he used often these these different phrases and, and was quite good at his sarcasm. And I have to give you credit here too, Douglas. I thought your introduction was quite lovely, especially I think you, you use at one point the uh, phrase highly motivated ideological brickbats, uh, mm. which is a nice, a nice way to describe Roger's uh, public enemies, I guess, for those <laughs> rather who put themselves against Roger publicly. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but, but getting into uh, one of the topics you described, especially in, in one way in which 
Roger might be seen as a heretic to uh, our situation today, both here in the States and, and even in the, uh, in the UK, um, uh, as it regards government and, and politics. Uh, he has the essay, Governing Rightly, in the book. I think it's the second essay in the book. And then he highlights, I think, two extremes, we might say, of, of poor government, or at least poor political cultures uh, that somehow lead to the same place. So on one hand, uh, we have what's happening in uh, Europe, what he calls the emasculated society of Europe, uh, in which the member states of the European Union are uh, ruled by a political class who hides behind closed doors, you know, skews uh, accountability as much as they can, yet continues to uh, issue endless edicts and, and rules from above, uh, regardless of culture, faith, or sovereignty of the of the member states. And then on the other hand, uh, which in some way I think actually leads into that culture just as much, you have the uh, the U.S. culture. Uh, Roger kind of points out, you know, although we we fight against it as much as we can, especially us American conservatives, we in some way have embraced this uh, Rousseauian view of of human nature. You know, whether it's a, a vestige of of pioneer culture or something of the sort some way in which we uh, we see ourselves as the upstart individual, you know, the, the lone person on the frontier who has to make himself free by, you know, uh, overthrowing the, the, the bonds of government or of culture or whatever it might be. And you can see obviously where this goes quite wrong in some instances, uh, but somehow it still remains, I wanna say at the heart of, of the American conservative experience, uh, at least as, as we've, we've seen it in the last 50 to, to 70 years uh, since the mid century. And, and the explosion of conservative thought in the states. It's always been, been one particular strand. Um, so uh, I, I guess, help me, help me think through this uh, in, in light of these, these dual evils or ills and, and uh, ways in which we lead to poor government, what does it mean to govern rightly? What is the sort of positive vision that Roger has uh, of the government and its role within society that, that doesn't fall into you know, bureaucrats uh, and the elite class giving us rules from above uh, and into the Rousseauian view that you know we we are by nature free individuals that become shackled through culture and, and by our bonds to one another, um, but really that that this is actually a good in life, right? How do we think about this and how do we address this, uh, and especially mm. these these heresies Roger was trying to uh, to highlight? It's it's a very interesting, important essay that one in the book, as is the one on on the nation state, and I think they're obviously interlinked. They come from the same well of 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 uh, Scruton's thought. Um, I say several things. One is that, that of course, he, he recognizes this thing, I think, as a phrase he uses, that, that, that we who object to the intrusion of government also have a great need for it. Right. Um, and this, this causes a tension, which, um, I mean, one wishes it could be simpler, uh, but it isn't. Uh, there is, of course, a further layer to that, isn't there, which is that uh, every country inevitably has its own... Um, its own things that it is conserving. Mm -hmm. And there are aspects of the American political tradition which Americans will continue to conserve, but which will seem quite alien to others. I've thought about this myself quite a lot in the last year or so. Um, look at responses to COVID in different countries. You know, they betray national trends at a very deep level, um, national beliefs at a very deep level. Some countries, for instance, as, as uh, Roger described, some countries have a deep distrust of government uh, uh, built into them, I mean, most obviously America. Um, others, for instance, Australia do not share that, so that even on the uh, political right, there is, there, is, there is not that great distrust of government. Broadly speaking, there is a type of consensus. Uh, Roger recognized that that was the same with uh, issues to do with the welfare state in different countries. I think, but I think this, 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 um, there's, there's two things in particular that need to be stressed about this. One is, I say, this issue of conserving things differently in different places. And the second is, is that issue of there not being a totalistic answer to everything that will apply in every country. I remember some years ago, uh, Roger doing an event at uh, the Royal Society, I think it was in London, uh, opposite Professor Terry Eagleton. And there was a very interesting um, moment, I was in the audience, and there was a very interesting moment of exchange where Eagleton came out with one of his, you know, sort of usual Marxist sort of theories to explain everything. And, and Roger just said, well, you know, we don't have, you know, answers to explain everything. Right. <laughs> and um, the audience reacted quite well to that. And I remember Eagleton was really quite annoyed and sort of said, well, as if not having answers is better than having answers. But of course, not having answers is better than having answers if the right. answers are terrible, um, mm -hmm. such as Marxism. So 
uh, anyhow, everything to do with the nation state, and it's a very subtle essay, that one, is, um, is, is well worth revisiting at the moment uh, because of the ways in which these, these issues of what we all uh, regard as being the role of government have been once again tested. And I think that this particular essay reads extremely well in the light of the last 18 months. Right. Well, and all the more so not to get too far uh, uh, distracted here, but with uh, the situation situation of, in Afghanistan, of, of all things, you know, we 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 Americans have been on a 20 year uh, experience in which we've tried to nation build. And um, it's clear uh, that we didn't think about it well enough, at least in the way that we ought to have thought about it if we were serious about nation building. Um, taking into consideration things like local culture and so forth. Uh, but but I think this gets to a larger point about Raj and perhaps his, his universal appeal that I've found, uh, which is, you know, at the heart, what Roger gives us is an example uh, of how to love our own and love it well. Um, mm -hmm. So getting to your first point in, in your response, right? So I think of things like uh, on hunting, which I know uh, you, I think in our, our launch event mentioned and, and somehow, you know, blew it up. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, to uh, ridiculous heights. I think that the last time I checked, you can purchase one on Amazon for three or four hundred dollars uh, because <laughs> it's not been. I wish I had a spare. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, so do I. But uh, but but in, in some way, you know, on hunting is a very peculiarly English book. Hmm. And I, as an American, don't have any any sort of experience and way to understand it insofar as. I have no real tie to hunting culture, fox hunting or anything of the sort. And I don't understand really the political controversy around it in, in, the, in the way that you in the UK do. Uh, but that being said, it, it's so accessible. And, and here, you know, you see Roger so clearly loving his own and, and giving a shining example that, you know, as an American, uh, all I can do is, you know, want to fox hunt. I just see this is, this is wonderful. I must go do this. I must get on a horse, though I've never ridden a horse. I must go and have this sort of experience, right? And and then I go over to the UK and talk to people about it, and they they laugh at me and say, "Well, you know, Fisher, it's it's not quite that. You know, you, you have to be careful and sensitive about these sorts of things." Uh, but but in some way, right? You know, it, it's this real um, insight into how we love our own. And and if I can phrase it this way, I think it's a, a case study um, in, in in some sense. You know, here here is a man loving his tradition well. And this is why it is um, communicable and really universally accessible, uh, is that he, he holds up the virtues of his own and invites you to hold up the virtues of yours uh, and recognizes them with you, of course. I, he's a very learned uh, mind and, and person and, and, and well, um, well educated in that regard. Uh, but, but I've always just found that interesting. I, I think you're, you're spot on with that, that um, you know, Roger teaches us to love, to love our own well and, and also leads us through it to some extent in that exercise. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, there's a number of things you touch on that we, we can go in, in some different ways. Perhaps we might might start with COVID. And I think this is an interesting uh, way to approach it insofar as, you know, I, I often have people talking to me and, and I'm sure you experienced this yourself too, saying, you know, I, I wish Roger were around today. I wish we, we ought to, or we, we could hear uh, what he had to say on our current situation, whether it's, you know, COVID or CRT or whatever it might be, you know, many, many number of topics. And, and especially, you know, uh, people have a lot to say about COVID and, and wanting to hear what Roger would have thought about it. Uh, and, and one interesting insight I think we, we at least have through this book, uh, Confessions of a Heretic, is the, um, the essay Hiding Behind the Screen. Uh, you know, mm. this, this might give us an, an insight into how, how he would respond to the times and, and the situations we find ourselves uh, today. So for those of you who haven't read it, I think it was included in the first edition, if I'm correct. Mm. Uh, but for those who aren't familiar, uh, the, the very simplified version of the argument uh, is that he, he highlights uh, one of the core ideas that German romantic philosophy has given us is this uh, idea of realization of the self through our responsibilities and uh, our responsible relations with others, excuse me. So by interacting with others, we come to understand the responsibility for our lives and actions, uh, our goals and characters, and in a larger sense, what, you know, freedom truly is, uh, freedom, excuse me, is truly made of. However, these uh, online interactions we have, uh, they don't represent real human interactions, right? They, uh, we, we don't encounter the other person face to face. We don't have that risk of judgment uh, uh, or potentially rejection uh, as we, we seek out consensus and, and whatever else it might be. Uh, instead, we live as avatars, interacting with other avatars, you know, liking things, commenting on things. And then whenever the threat seems too, too great to ourselves, we can always turn the screen off uh, and step away and, and go have, you know, a burger or a snack or whatever it might be uh, in the other room and then come back when, when our nerves have calmed down. Um, and, and by this, by doing so, we've habituated ourselves uh, to, to life through a screen. 
uh, and we lose in some sense human capacities, right? Uh, th these capacities that are central to experience uh, and, and, and lives such as friendship or justice or love. Uh, and mm -hmm. so as, as someone who has had a child during COVID, you know, my daughter's now one years old, she was born last June. I'm, I'm very aware uh, of this effect and acutely so. Um, I can tell that she hasn't had the same experiences that my son, who's only two years older than her, has. And, and that, you know, as much as we try and get out, we still have this odd thing where even in it, human interactions are mediated through this mask that covers half the face, which uh, mm -hmm. as we both know, Douglas, is, is very important uh, to Roger's thinking. So uh, I think in some way this gives us an answer, but, but perhaps you can help us think through Douglas and, and really help me consider, you know, how do we get back to normal from here? How do we recover <laughs> these lost human capacities mm. that have been so, so deeply affected and shifted? And, and, and you know, we, we, we might be able to make some, some more deeper critiques and comments of people right now, but it seems that there's a real willingness to stay online, to avoid mm. the in-person and the threats and, and um, and issues that that imposes upon us but but please help me Douglas you know mm. <laughs> help me think through how do I how do I bring my kids into this world and, and make them understand that you know life isn't like this this isn't how sh things should normally be um I think that one of those interesting things in in, in the, the essay uh, um that you mentioned is this is this thought that that Scruton did did uh, elaborate on elsewhere as well but I think this is the one that's most rooted in the philosophical thought is is this issue of, of the era of the, the difficulty of being of being caught in the screen and the difficulty of a, a really very simple thing it sounds simple and as we know and as you know as a parent it's not simple but the simple thing is to take your eyes off the screen and look up again um uh, to look out of the window uh, now that might be the computer screen it might be the television screen uh, uh, Spruton was a long time uh, critic of uh, television um, and his own attitude was I think I think in the end he slightly gave in on having a television uh, so if you would know this better but I think he slightly gave in but I think that the agreement was that there was a television in the cupboard that would be taken out and watched for a special <laughs> event as it were, and then put back in which by the way is I, I think I've got that right but it's a piece of advice I've um, often passed on to people uh, um, completely miss out on on these things. You miss out on a lot of popular culture, and indeed a way of interacting with your peers, which for children in particular is very important. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to be immersed in it. Right. Uh, I always thought this 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 attitude towards it as being that the screen was something that you you could you could take out, but you also needed to put it back. It shouldn't, for instance, be that omnipresent thing. Um, it's a slightly uh, specific point to make, perhaps, but you notice it in terms of design. When when the design of a living space has all chairs facing towards the screen, right? So that even when the television is off, it is the absent thing in the room, and the temptation is precisely to put it on because otherwise it's the empty chair at the non-feast. Um, and 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 everything to do with this uh, and in the essay in confessions of heretic about this is very important i think for us to read now because we are all trying to um work out and particularly with the next generation bringing them up work out what the attitude towards the screen ought to be right. uh the engagement between the real world and not every parent knows the ease that can come from putting a child in front of a screen for a while and the peace that can come and the temptation to draw that piece out further and further. But of course, um, domesticating and civilizing a, a person uh, most importantly includes interactions with other people. Um, Roger wrote about this very movingly in England, an elegy uh, mm. book from the late 1990s, um, where he wrote about one of his school teachers at the grammar school he was at in High Wycombe, um, who, who would throw you know, um, socializing events effectively, extracurricular for the pupils, the students to, to learn certain things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these are very important moments, uh, uh, learning social interaction. Now, we, we have just been through an 18 month period where um, a problem that already existed, a challenge, we say, that already existed, has now been forced upon us much more. Uh, we were effectively forced into isolation and, and seeing people again, primarily through the screen for a very long time. It, it, it's embedded a problem that already existed. Right. Um, but just because a challenge exists, it does not mean that you have to uh, uh, give into it. Um, yeah. 
uh, a famous television host in America, um, uh, Tucker Carlson, admitted in an interview yesterday that he himself doesn't have a television. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I've always agreed with the Noel Coward maxim that television is is um, to be on, not to watch. Right. I, I think that I think it was Noel. I know it was Paul Vidal, maybe, who said that. But um, <laughs> but anyway. Um, um, it's uh, it's a very big challenge. It's something we do have to think about, and we have to find a way through. Um, how do you, for instance, deal with um, bringing people up to read well, uh, to read a book well, a long book, a di difficult book, um, in an era of Twitter and of Facebook and Instagram, uh, where that um, endorphin hit is is more easily achieved or more swiftly achieved? Uh, uh, the, these these are very important problems. And I, again, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, that in this essay, as in so many others in the volume, um, uh, Scruton ha has has left um, a, a signal of what we might think. So that actually, uh, when people have said to me, you know, I wonder what Roger would think about that, I, I've tended to say to them, well, you can find out by going to his work. You know, it's not just that he left clues, he told us. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, this, uh, that's why I've said I, I, I've given this to as many people as I can, just because I think it really uh, introduces people to Roger's wide range of thinking in, uh, as it were, digestible um, mm. bites. You know, it's, it's not it's not a 100 or 200 or 300 page volume or tome or book on, on whatever mm. specific subject, but it's 10 pages or 20 pages. Um, that allow you to dip into his thoughts on on human relations or uh, on uh, um, the government or or whatever it might be uh, building two uh, he talks about buildings and and so perhaps I might might take us there especially as we're considering community and and life with one another you know one of the questions I've I've gotten a couple times is uh, you know people will, will come and say you know I I agree with Roger in a, in a number of ways I think he's spot on but I never quite got his fascination with with building and with architecture, with urbanism and why it's so important and why we should even care about this sort of thing. You know, is, is there any short little uh, essay or is there short some some short piece where he effectively communicates this and and makes it clear to us um, why why we ought to care about how we build? So, I, of course, I would say go read. I think what's the, uh, the essay is called building to last a uh, wonderful mm. wonderful little essay when he talks about in which he talks about leon creer's thought uh, and, and how leon uh creer was a really really a pioneer in this field and, and has helped bring about uh, new urbanism as it were in traditional architecture uh but mm. but i, I want to ask you douglas to do my job for me and uh, <laughs> help outline you know why is the way we build so important what is the connection roger saw in the way that we build and the way that we live our lives well, it, it, it's an interesting question. Because it, 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 like so many other things that Roger wrote about, it's it's surprising that other people didn't, or at mm. least um, relegated it to lesser thinkers to think about. Um, I mean, it's, it's very curious to um, not engage with the question of the environment around you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Roger obviously wrote extensively about the countryside, principally about the English countryside and about um, ecology and uh, um uh, and much more, and of course, in green conservatism, uh, addressed uh, very thoroughly what he saw as being an answer that uh, um, conservatives might have to the whole question of the environment. But uh, obviously, the built environment is is unavoidable. I mean, one, one of the one of the striking things is, of course, because as the as the argument goes, um, architecture is the one art form that is effectively forced on everybody. Um, Nobody is forced to listen every day to the works of Harrison Bertwistle. If they want to listen to them, they can. They don't have to. Um, nobody is forced to um, look at the work of Mark Rothko every day or of Jeff Koons, thank goodness. Um, unless you have the um, misfortune to be living in a place with an installation by Koons in it. Right. Um, in which case you'll feel your IQ drop every day. But, <laughs> but, the, but the point is, of course, with architecture, you are forced to live with it. Everybody is forced to live with it. I remember once being in Sweden with Roger and um, we were in some, I can't remember, a town in the middle of the country um, where there were just these great monstrosities, great glass blocks. Mm -hmm. uh, steel and glass blocks. And I remember Roger saying in the middle of the street as we looked up at it, he just said, this is a building that says 
you do not matter. Um, and it did right. because it could have been anywhere. It could have been anywhere. It yeah. happened to be in the middle of this rather beautiful, could have been beautiful Swedish town um, and in the middle of a very beautiful countryside. But the point is, is everybody was forced to live in the shadow of this building and others like it. And it's the same in almost every uh, um, developed city. So obviously we, we should care about this and should make sure that all of the running is not done by people with the worst ideas and the worst attitudes. So um, given, as I say, that it is the art form that we all do have to live with, we, we ought to be allowed to have a say in it. And we ought to, and, and one of Roger's insights about this, of course, is that if you do give people the choice, they do want to live in beautiful buildings. They don't, they don't actually want to live in the, Corbusier like uh, um, um, nightmare, right? And uh, I mean, there are some exceptions, but 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 this and this was, of course, the work that Roger was doing in the last year or so of his life uh, for the Conservative government on the Building Beautiful Commission, mm -hmm. um, and and I, which I hope very much is, is is kept alive and followed through on. But this this issue comes; it's like the issue of, of beauty, which Roger spent so much of his life thinking about. It's striking how many others did not think about this question and he thought it rather surprising that Roger did. But of course, um, what should you think of other than beauty? Um, what are the contenders, the things that are more important? Um, I don't know. But once again, as I say, with architecture as with aesthetics, he, he, he knew the significance of applying himself to the things that mattered. Right. Well, and there's that great criticism I always find, you know, people love to make, uh, which is that, you know, he, here are people like Jeff Koons or whoever it is, you know, uh, whatever modern architect um, or, or artist, uh, and, and they're making these, well, if I can be so bold, monstrosities, uh, or, or at least uh, ugly things. Uh, and yet they find themselves, you know, trying to attain and live in the nicest neighborhoods and have these beautiful Victorian homes if they're in, you know, London oh, yeah. or whatever it would be, uh, because they understand. I mean, this is something that that people get intrinsically, and I, I'll try and make the argument to people. You know, we ought to care about how things are built, and they'll give you the typical line, right? You know, well, well, who are you to impose your taste upon me? Or, you know, I think it's quite nice. It's good to have a diversity of of things, uh, but it's something that they all get intuitively. I think at a deeper level, when you say, well, should we send our, our five-year-olds to kindergarten, as we call it here in the States, you know, preschool uh, and a penitentiary. Is this a good thing? You know, should we send them into a concrete block that has, you know, small windows high up in the ceiling uh, and say that it's a beautiful piece of architecture and then leave them there from, you know, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and, and imagine that they're going to do well in life, that, that this is something that's uh, inculcating good things and virtuous things in them. Uh, or do we understand that there's something quite uh, oppressive about it. You know, every, everyone hates, uh, at least here in the States, right? You know, everyone looks back on their elementary school or, or high school, as we call it, uh, educations, uh, grammar school ed educations, and, and have frustrations about it. They feel like they're being institutionalized, that you make these, these simple observations and they say, ah, okay, you know, here is the panopticon. Here is the reason why we, we feel this way, because it actually gets at something deeper uh, and, and the way that we live our lives. Um, Yes, I mean right. this, this issue of being of, of claiming that people are forcing, um, uh, as I say, architecture is forced upon people. Right, it, it already is the situation. So when somebody says, you know, um, a, a, a certain uh, trends in response to that shouldn't be followed through on, because otherwise you're forcing your tastes on people. Again, go back to who forced their tastes on people first in this regard, and whose vision is the more brutal and um, unlivable. Right. Um, and by the way, there's one important point that needs to be made as well, which comes out of what you just said about the wealthy architects who create monstrosities themselves living in beautiful uh, houses, uh, which is completely true in my experience, um, which is that I, I think Roger understood, uh, um, realized this very early because of something he writes about in his memoirs, um, in Gentle Regrets in particular, mm -hmm. which is the experience he had with his own father, who was a man of the left, but who cared very deeply about what was happening um, to his hometown in High Wycombe and, and, and right. the, the, the destruction of it, um, the dissolution of it really. And uh, it's important to say this because this is a non-political point in a way. Um, and it's very important, I think, that for Roger Scruton's legacy that people realize that it's true he was the most distinguished conservative philosopher of his, of his time, but I would also like to see him talked of as a philosopher, 
um, uh, without any uh, um, appendage, right. because because on issues like the built environment, there is no need for this to be seen through a right or left lens. In the same way as it doesn't need to be seen as an elite versus um, uh, I don't know um, working class or uh, um, issue. Um, I, th I think in an event, in an event that Roger and I did for the Spectator, perhaps I think last one of the last public events he did, um, he mentioned in passing, um, you know, nobody would object if we built Bath again, and um, uh, everybody in the audience burst out laughing, and it was the laughter of recognition because it was so right. obvious. Because so many people would love to live on the Royal Crescent in Bath. Um, uh, there's not no particular reason. It's obviously everybody can't, but there's no particular reason why it wouldn't be more possible for more people to live in such a beautiful environment. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly not for it to be the, the, the situation some of us worry about in European cities, which is that effectively you just have very, very bleak areas which people desperate to escape from and only a few lucky people can. That seems to me uh, um, quite wrong and, and not a not a left wing view either. Right. Well, on this topic, there was a quote I wanted to read. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. It's a little bit of a longer quote. Uh, but one in which, you know, he's talking, of course, about this issue, but I think it also highlights uh, the appeal of Roger and, and what he specifically um, offers us in a, in a way that's different than perhaps much of the elders, uh, other great thinkers in the conservative intellectual tradition. But he says, within Building to Last, this, this uh, essay, says, there are those who say, not of career only, but of the whole new urbanist movement, that it is all very well, but that it comes too late. The centrifugal tendency of the city is now irreversible and the steel frame and curtain wall are here to stay. Such critics, it seems to me, need to be reminded that sprawl is unsustainable and will inevitably produce a situation in which centripetal movement is the only alternative to social collapse. As Quinlan Terry has repeatedly demonstrated, building with steel frame and curtain wall is also unsustainable. Structures built in this way quickly become derelict or too costly to maintain and leave in their wake a quantity of poison that is now all but impossible to bury. Moreover, they are unadaptable and can rarely change use as the world around them changes. When the new urbanists are proposing, what the new urbanists are proposing is not a utopia, but the only viable alternative to continuing urban decline. Now, I know that's that's a very specific context, mm. uh, but in some sense, I, I think, you know, if I can generalize from this, it, it highlights what Roger noticed was, you know, our situation is unsustainable, it's untenable, and eventually there's going to have to be some sort of reaction. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I think this is the enduring appeal of Roger, uh, if, if I might say so, is that he, you know, when you look at the, the conservative intellectual tradition, I think everyone has these great uh, elegaic qualities, whether it's Russell Kirk or Alan Bloom, or even today, people like Rod Dreher or Peter Hitchens, you know, people who are able to lament mm -hmm. Roger himself very well, you know, as you mentioned, uh, England and Algae. Um, but uh, there's this deep sense of, of loss uh, and a yearning for a way of life that's passed in some way. Uh, and then we can't quite access it, but we can attempt to access it. Or we can attempt to mm. get it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you what you think um, within, given this context and given that quote, you know, what exactly is it that makes Raj unique? What did he notice? What, what gave him this sort of difference of insight um, mm. that, that others in some sense lack or don't quite get to? You know, whenever I read Roger, I leave hopeful. I don't leave mm. distracted and, and feeling that the world is falling apart around me, but that there is still some small kernel of hope. Well, that's because, that's because he was willing to address himself to questions underneath the questions. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's an essay in this volume in Confessions of a Heretic that I'm particularly fond of um, called Effing the Ineffable, uh, which is, a th I think, only three pages long or so, but I really urge people to, to read um, because it, it's, it's effectively about the question of what it is we cannot describe or what it is we yearn for but cannot reach. Mm -hmm. Um, he starts off by talking about Aquinas, as, as I remember, um, and, and, and goes through fleetingly, um, uh, remarkably, a, a set of thinkers who, who have struggled with the same question. What is the thing that is, is um, beyond the window, the, the place we want to look to, uh, uh, that we do look to as having a vision? Uh, why is it that we cannot describe it, we find it so difficult to describe it. 
um, as he says in that essay, I think he says, you know, I, I too am tempted to try to F the ineffable. Um, and I, I stress it because it acknowledges a depth we wish to reach and simultaneously says that the, that the reaching will almost always be um, incomplete. Hmm. Uh, and this, but this is a very important point. And by the way, there's there's one other thing. Well, one of the other essays in this volume I'm particularly um, fond of is the one, on, the reflections on the metamorphosis of uh, Richard Strauss, which is a, a really remarkable essay on a piece of music which, uh, if people don't know, they 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 should should listen to. Uh, a very mournful, beautiful piece uh, by Richard Strauss, a late work, which, as as um, as Roger says effectively carries out the act of what um, uh, Freud in mourning melancholia would recognize as, as the act of mourning that is necessary in order to have a, a birth again, that, that the dead thing needs to be buried in order that you will live again. And uh, Rogers argues this is this is what uh, Strauss is doing in the Metamorphosum, which refers to which ref itself as a piece refers back to earlier composers in the German tradition um, and seems to be uh, giving a swan song for that tradition. Um, but but this this too applies to this process of, of mourning what is lost and of uh, um, trying to recognize what can be regained. I mean, something which um, I'm very fond of that Roger wrote about a number of times was something which also reflected my own experience, which is how he was saved from mere conservative declinism. Uh, um, he read Spengler very early and was enormously impressed by it uh, then, but says somewhere, I think in Gentle Regrets, that it was T.S. Eliot who saved him from Spengler. Uh, which was, although it wasn't Spengler I was being saved from, T.S. Eliot gave the same um, hope to me. And it's a hope that I think Roger passes on, which is that the thing that is lost need not have been lost forever. Right. And um, can be regained. Uh, this this is an extremely important and, of course, hopeful insight. Um, uh, there's no need to be... Um, endlessly mournful of a thing which can be recaptured. That's great. Well, uh, so I have perhaps two more questions if you'll allow me to ask two more uh, before we get to audience questions. So again, I invite everyone watching, uh, please through the Q&A feature below, write up your questions submitted here and I'll, I'll be asking Douglas uh, some of your questions in a couple minutes. Uh, but on this topic of um, really how we respond to these things and, and uh, seek to find hope, you know, and, and what's the way forward. I think as I've really been thinking, well, as I've been thinking about things uh, more generally and, and Roger's work, uh, there's that first essay in the book, it's um, Faking It, uh, which is a wonderful mm. essay. I've, I've quoted it before, I think, on our newsletters and and shared the uh, the recording of it, which I think there's a BBC, he, he delivered it for a BBC uh, recording at one point um, for the radio. Uh, but in it, he talks about sentimentality uh, and, and sentimentality, not in the way that we typically think of where it's, oh, I have this sentimental love for a picture or a teddy bear I had as a kid, but rather uh, this deeper sort of sentimentality, a sentimentality of emotion uh, in which uh, to some extent we, we fake it so much that we delude ourselves into believing it's real. This classic example, I think, is, is that the sentimental lover, the one who, who mm. finds a relationship, you know, their new lover, say Bob finds, finds Jane and, and loves Jane with all his heart and is throwing himself over her and then breaks up with her and is crying about it and finds himself just in such deep emotion. Yet at the end of the day, he never really cared about Jane herself, but rather what Jane allowed him to feel and, and think of himself as this grand romantic uh, who loved mm. deeply and who felt things deeply and so on and so forth. Um, and in some way, I think at the heart of Roger's work is this attack against sentimentality across the board. So we see this, of course, in his, his philosophy and looking at emotions, uh, but we see it in art. And this is naturally, I think, what, what that first essay is all about, is uh, uh, arguing against kitsch and, and arguing for the yes. place of beauty uh, in art. We see this in his response to um, the built environment and the natural environment, even, you know, these, these sorts of, of fake ways of, of trying to argue for things uh, that don't really matter in the end. Uh, and even, you know, sort of sentimentality within human relations. Um, as we, we see in, in hiding hiding behind the screen, uh, in which you know we we seek replacements or fake fake uh, experiences, and not really trying to seek the other person. Mm. Um, so so in some way, you know, we might be able to say Roger's work is is one against sentimentality. You know, this is yeah. a, a, 
uh, overall theme that, that kind of connects uh, many of his different thoughts is, you know, how, how do we stop sentimentality? How do we respond to it and actually offer mm -hmm. something that's place, which I, I think you just, you know, got at yourself mm -hmm. too. Um, but, but it seems to be uh, in some way at the heart of the heart of his thought. Yeah, that's right. I, all I can say is that I, I couldn't improve on what R Roger himself writes about this subject. I really recommend people to read the essay. I mean, what he wrote there, and I think in his book uh, on beauty about kitsch and sentimentality in art in particular, is 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 very profound and is something which uh, I think that people will be referring back to for a long time to come. Um, his insights on kitsch in art. Uh, um, and and sentimentality in the way the culture is extremely important and of course was it should be said as well rather brave in its time to say because there were so many the rise of the sentimentalists uh, coincided with with roger's own um rise to prominence mm -hmm. and so um uh, lambasting them and attacking them uh, um, at their root was a very important thing to do but a very unpopular one mm -hmm. well i'll just say i had the uh the great fun and misfortune of doing my master's thesis with Roger on, on essentially the question of how, you know, how does beauty or interactions with beauty and art uh, shape us and affect us morally? Uh, and uh, a great portion of it ended up being on kitsch, uh, which I came to find that Roger explained it far better than I ever could and, and made much greater of a contribution than I ever could within a 10 minute little talk he gave, you know, for the BBC <laughs> radio. And here I was doomed to write 20,000 words uh, on the topic when I knew I couldn't ever improve or say anything, you know, beyond what <laughs> Roger. Roger himself said, <laughs> but, uh, but, but so the final question I want to put before you, Douglas, and we'll get into about 10, 15 minutes of, of questions from the audience. Uh, as we, we think about the bigger picture with Roger and his legacy and, and going back to uh, the, the talk you mentioned um, earlier uh, that you did with him in, uh, uh, through The Spectator in July 2019, I believe it was, uh, there was a point at the end uh, or closer to the end of the conversation when you talked about uh, the future uh, of the university of education systems of institutions, I think, generally within society, and uh, it seemed in some need that the or some some way the consensus was that uh, you and Roger both thought we ought to move beyond the current structures that we have and, and seek to create replacements or para universities or something of the sort. Mm. Um, so so if you can allow me, I, I perhaps want to push back a little and, and just ask the question: You know, is it are, are we truly doomed to to leave these institutions? It's obvious. I'll say that uh, the elites or the ruling class. Uh, these classes have in some way failed larger society you know we we see this in the ivy leagues we see this in the big corporations and our even our governments you know uh, a great disconnect uh with with the regular people and, and the feelings and thoughts of the regular people um but my my hesitancy is you know ought, ought we not take on our own long march through the institutions ourselves ought, ought, conser ought conservatives uh, respond with that same sort of long game mentality in which we say these things are too valuable and precious to us and to who we are to to give them up you know whether it's the billion dollar endowment at harvard or rather just the institution of harvard itself right you know are are we at the point in which it's time to abandon these things and, and make a new which in some sense we can say yes but but does that mean that we have to leave them alone and, and move beyond them uh, are there only ever two answers to this question? One is to revive and save, rescue the institutions that exist, and the other one is to create new institutions. I've always been a, f a fan of both. Mm -hmm. I think that people who are in institutions and who can bravely and um, deftly make their way through them should should make that journey, difficult as it may be. And I quite often urge people not to take the sometimes easier route of stepping away from these institutions if they can at all help it. It may be taken out of their hands. They should hold on as long as they can, like snipers up trees, uh, an invading army. Um, uh, so I, I do think that that both should be done. Mm. Um, and and again, institutions can be saved, like everything else. All it requires mm. is a few good people or better people to um, to get the reins. Um, and I see signs of that, by the way. I'm, I'm rather optimistic about that. I think that. Um, uh, and I think that there's also an extent to which the um, um, postmodern moment is uh, is is crumbling, um, intellectually speaking, not before time. Um, the vacuity of it seems so obvious um, to so many people. It's extremely hard to point to anything that the social sciences have uh, answered. Um, it's difficult to find one thing they've applied to themselves to that they've made better. 
um, uh, the only conclusion the social scientists come to is that they need more social scientists, whereas <laughs> we clearly need less, if any. Um, Absolutely. Well, very good. Well, so uh, I'll take some questions from the audience now and, and ask you here, uh, Douglas. So uh, the first is from Hogan. It says, Douglas, as you reflect on your relationship with Sir Roger, is there anything special about Roger that you came to realize only after his passing? Some aspect of him that was impressed upon you, not in his presence, but in his absence? Gosh, what a good question. A very difficult one, a very moving one, actually. Um, uh, I suppose uh, you know, that thing you always feel uh, with somebody who you love and admire, which is you wonder how on earth they will ever be replaced and then have to realize that they won't be. Um, um, but that that is that is the point in a way um, that people um, are irreplaceable and people like Roger in particular. Um, I do think that thing, the fact that the constellations were of, of uh, there being so many of his works, which you can reach up onto the shelf and get the volume down and remind yourself what he thought about something or would have thought. That's a, a great consolation. I think that, I, I think that though in general, the the thing that is um, uh, that has been impressed on me since his death has been is that um, disappearance of such a um, uh, a store of wisdom and knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, there are some you know very many remarkable people in our day and some wonderful thinkers and writers but it's hard to think of anyone who could do everything that roger could and i um i quite often when i was working almost always when i was working on a book would speak with roger um download some of his thoughts as you say fisher you, you could do in 10 minutes what other people could do in vol couldn't do in volumes um uh but i mean the thing which the thing which has uh, really struck me i mean i knew it whilst he was alive I think it's been more obvious since his passing has been the the, the number of people whose lives he affected uh, for the better. It's it, it's quite remarkable. Just I I knew it. I saw it. Um, we were once at a conference where he um, he came slightly late uh, to something. It turned out he just told me afterwards that he'd been there was a student somewhere in Belgium or somewhere who had reached out to him because he was having a deep problems about things intellectually and elsewhere and, and and roger had given up his morning just to spend time with this person help him and um uh, i've i've discovered as i think quite a lot of people have the number of people who sort of come out of the woodwork since his death who who relayed similar stories and it's um it, it's it's remarkable because you can remove yourself from the world the philosopher in particular can remove themselves from the world but it's it's such a mistake to do so because um if you do do that you don't produce this number of as it were intellectual children intellectual right. offspring right well and, and just to comment on that too from my own experience with the from the perch of the foundation um it's just i mean it's truly touching to see the sort of people that have come out and, and even sent me private messages saying that they you know I, I remember i think after the launch i received one email um that just moved me this fellow said you know I, i'm so sorry that I never reached out to Roger when he was living, but I wanted to let him know how much he meant to me uh, mm -hmm. and, and how much his thought yeah. you know, uh, shaped me and, and impressed upon me. And, and seeing as I can't do this to him now, I do this to you, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I just had to accept it. You know, here I am just trying to honor honor Roger myself, but but uh, it's just been so amazing to see the, the general response, not only from the States, not only from the UK, but from everywhere. I mean, Central Europe, yeah. of course, but Brazil um, and, and, and all over. Uh, it's, yeah. it's just been truly special. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm going to ask three more questions if we might go on a little bit longer. So forgive me. Uh, one other question we have is from Emma. She says, I would like to ask Douglas how he thinks we can best increase the exposure young people have to Sir Roger Scruton's work. The earlier one is exposed to Sir Roger's philosophy, the more it enriches one's life. I'm saddened by how many so how so many young people, excuse me, are missing out on benefiting from Sir Roger's wisdom. Well, I, I, the obvious way is through volumes like this. Um, mm. I think I think his essays, like some of the essays in, well, all of the essays in um, Confessions of a Heretic, are a good place to start, Fisher, because as you mentioned, they, they are bite-sized. Um, I mentioned on hunting before when we spoke, uh, um, because it's, it's relatively bite-sized as well. Um, right. And I think then it can lead people in things. I think that there are some of his books that are, um, are not places I'd advise people to start. Um, uh, some of the more dense works. Um, 
but but these are obviously ways in and and one way i i think i might, might mention before is is the remarkable um impact of his documentary on beauty which is a the documentary of effectively of the short book he wrote for oxford university press um and, and that's remarkable because among other things that was a, one of a series of, of of programs actually the bbc commissioned and it's the only one that's had any afterlife um and it goes on having such an afterlife as it should um um, some of his or well, many of his lectures are, are online uh, from a wide range of countries and venues um, and in the era of YouTube these are wonderful places to discover something anyone is much better off spending an hour watching a lecture of Rogers from you know the last 30 years than they are uh, watching anything else on YouTube which is as, as good as anything you could find absolutely I completely agree with it all. And, and uh, you know, it's a shame. I think um, the uh, Why Beauty Matters the BBC documentary has finally been completely scrubbed from YouTube. They removed the final really? sort of British recording, or uh, excuse me, not British, the, the Brazilian version, which I think has Portuguese uh, subtitles. There was one with Portuguese subtitles. It had and so it's only available on Vimeo view. now. Uh, I think this is the, the last the last place that uh, the, the documentary yeah. is uh, available for public watching. Which, uh, you know, perhaps I might get in trouble for saying this, but if anyone out there has any good connections or ideas as to how to get, you know, the right people to uh, to release this and, and relinquish their uh, their tight grip over it, then please, please let us know. <laughs> Reach out. Yeah. It will be a moment when we believe intellectual copyright theft to be a good thing. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the, the penultimate question I'll, I'll give just because I thought it was worth uh, bringing up. Uh, and, and my apologies, I'll just say in advance, Alderic, who's, who's writing to us from Germany. He says, many thanks to you both for this, this discussion. Uh, up to this point, you haven't touched on the essay, Conserving Nature. I sometimes fear that Scruton's environmentalism tends to fall by the wayside, even if my opinion, uh, it, even if in my opinion, it is central to his work, but seen by too many conservatives as a left-wing topic. Can you comment on this? Mm. I think that's true. I, 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 I didn't mean to skip over it today. There are so many essays in the volume that we've right. been here all day to discuss them. but. Uh, I, th I think uh, our, our friend may be uh, correct, certainly that the conservatives tend to avoid it. I think there's a re reason for that, by the way, which is built into it, which is that sometimes the subject is of particular interest to one political side, and this effectively puts the other political side off looking into it. Mm -hmm. You could say that that's the case to an extent with um, um, certain issues that the right is interested in. I mean, the right has been much interested in immigration, for instance, and I think it's uh, put off the left from in dealing or engaging with this question. They think that it would make them right wing to do so. And I think that there is something similar that, that has happened in um, debates around uh, nature and the natural environment. Mm -hmm. It's very similar, I think, because it was so much uh, picked up by um, the sort of people who've been described as watermelons, you know, green on the outside, red on the inside. Because of that phenomenon, I think quite a lot of conservatives have stayed clear of it, and I think it's to their detriment. Um, but it is an interesting thing, the way in which that does happen in the political discourse, that, that a, a side is effectively um, encouraged not to think of something because they fear that it is something that only their intellectual opponents think about. Uh, inequality would be a good example, that the right used to think about inequality, then the left ended up thinking about it, and the right didn't bother because it seemed like a left-wing thing to be thinking about. Yeah. Well, and I'll say I had a couple of questions lined up on this. We just didn't have time to get to it. Um, but but in his discussions of, of the environment and, and what should be seen as the conservative case for it, or rather why environmentalism is, is a sort of conservative uh, um, issue in the first place, is I think the wonderful idea that I, I would say is one of Roger's biggest contributions, which is that of oikophilia. Mm -hmm. uh, and this term, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar watching, uh, Roger coins this term oikophilia based off of uh, the Greek words oikos and, and philia, oikos being you know, uh, the house and, and the root of oiko, oikonomia, which is the, the household economy, and philia being love of. So he says, this is the love of home. And it's not only the love of the place of home, but it's the love of the customs. It's the love of the people in there. It's the love of the building itself and, and uh, the community that it's in, as well as the land that it's on. Uh, and he says, this is you know, the sort of root cause or root motive uh, of all conservative action is this love of home. And this desire to uh, preserve it and care for it and pass it on as we've experienced to future generations. And I think there are few better places than going to Rogers. It's called 
uh, the case for environmental conservatism here in the States, but his green philosophy in the UK. And, and you just see this beautiful, wonderful philosophical reflection uh, on home mm. and, and what it means and why it's important. And he, he touches on it in other books and talks about um, uh, oikophobia uh, and say the West and the rest and the need for the nations and so forth. Uh, which is which is a, a paired concept, which is the the repudiation of home or the hatred of home, um, but but I think his work on the environment uh, just so clearly outlines that and highlights uh, what what really is one of his great contributions, I think, and, and most beautiful and moving ones. Uh, and even there's this great, I mean, just a, a long reflection on literature and its sort of foundational um, uh, place within Western civilization for this return to home, whether you see it uh, in in the, the Jewish Bible. Um, and, and the story of looking for the promised land's return to home or um, in uh, uh, Homer uh, and uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the Odyssey and Odysseus trying to get back to home. It's this, this constant longing for home and, and what is rightfully ours and, and where we belong. Yes. Um, so I, I'll ask one last question here, Douglas. I know we're a couple minutes over now, so forgive me. Uh, but, but the last one is from John. He says, similar to Mr. Dedarian's final question, to be a heretic is to recognize and establish order, which Roger Scroon theoretically could have conserved, yet he did not. What was his principle for distinguishing among institutions to conserve and institutions to not conserve? That's a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer to it because I don't know if he gave an answer to that explicitly. Um, Obviously, like all philosophers, he recognized the importance of the academy, the university, the, the importance of preserving institutions of education. He recognized the importance of, of, of institutions, um, including ones that have become relatively unpopular. I mean, he, of course, he, he wrote in Our Church about the importance of the institution of the Church of England, uh, again, quite an unpopular argument to have made, but a very beautiful and resonant argument that certainly resonates with me, um, where he talks about what, despite all, or in spite of all of the, the issues that the church has uh, and the things that it now lacks, uh, reminded people of what it also, the riches it also possesses and the way in which this can be a wellspring to which people should return uh, and can return. I mean, for instance, his own attitude towards r religion, even in the period where he was, I perhaps least sympathetic to it was always that you shouldn't war on it, um, which became my own view as well. Um, uh, so there were there was uh, there were institutions which he which he respected and wanted uh, to continue, even if he thought that they were um, flawed or lacking. Um, I, I think that I think that he recognised, of course, and he writes about this in the Need for Nations that. He recognized the, that, that you, you, a society cannot cohere unless it does respect some institutions. You know, um, if, if, if the law, for instance, is, is not respected, then obviously, you know, um, you lose a lot of other things as well. And uh, simply disliking institutions for the sake of disliking them is, is, um, is a sort of juvenile but quite persistent um, uh, tendency of our time, which he obviously um, rebelled against. By the way, if this is the last question, Fisher, um, um, can I um, can I just highlight two things which we we've 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 um, uh, skipped over, as it were, briefly, but uh, it would be good to end on perhaps. Uh, one is I mentioned earlier this. I've I've got the virtual uh, PDF of the of the book in front of me, so I was slightly searching for it. Um, although I promise I was listening to you, um, but um, but uh, the the, the the, the 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 essay I mentioned, Effing the Ineffable, about this issue of the thing you wish to reach, which is so difficult to reach, has a, a particularly beautiful moment in this essay. He says, um, um, anybody who goes through life with open mind and open heart will encounter these moments of revelation, moments that are saturated with meaning, but whose meaning cannot be put into words. These moments are precious to us. When they occur, it is as though on the winding, ill-lit stairway of our life, we suddenly come across a window through which we catch sight of another and brighter world, a world to which we belong, but which we cannot enter. Um, and then just one other um, thing I wanted to mention, which was the, uh, which is something which is, we haven't touched on, but is perhaps a good place to, to finish, which is an essay in the, 
in the volume uh, on dying, which I have to say, when I reread it uh, um, uh, earlier this year in preparation for writing the introduction to this new edition of Confessions of a Heretic, uh, I was worried about uh, reading again because I'm worried it would be upsetting or um, uh, or also, of course, th that perhaps he hadn't said five years ago his final word on dying. And, and um, of course, I was quite wrong in my fears. Uh, um, as ever, Roger had uh, risen uh, to the occasion. Um, but he, he says in, in the essay on dying, um, uh, something which is now is quoted on the, on, on the cover of, the, of the, the new edition of Confessions of a Heretic. And he says this, which I think is as close to a personal, as it were, credo that, as I've ever seen him write. It's called Dying in Time. And uh, Roger Scruton writes in that essay, he says, the main point, it seems to me, is to maintain a life of active risk and affection while helping the body along the path of decay, remembering always that the value of life does not consist in its length, but in its depth. There's not much more to say beyond that, is there, Douglas? <laughs> there isn't. Uh, yeah, well, well, we'll end it there. But Douglas, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you for uh, discussing Confessions of a Heretic and, of course, for a wonderful introduction. I encourage all of you uh, still watching to go out and purchase it yourself. Uh, but uh, I'll invite Kim uh, back on to uh, to close us out and say a couple of words before uh, we we end today's uh, broadcast. Oh, you're you're muted, Kim. There we are. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much to both Fisher and Douglas. That was an absolutely fascinating conversation. I think we've all understood a lot more. I certainly have about Scruton's wider breadth of thinking. Um, I'm really delighted to say as well that since we first published this book, which has got that quote that Douglas gave on the front, um, only about a month ago, and we are virtually sold out of copies. So please do visit nottinghilleditions.com if you want to grab a first edition before they are gone um, and put your order in. This is a lovely hardback book and it's a format that... Uh, Roger, very much appreciated. So um, we, we'd be delighted to have your orders. And um, as Douglas said, if you want to know what Roger Scruton would say about the issues facing us today, you can find them in his work. And you really can find them in 12 beautiful essays. I think the only thing that we didn't mention tonight was that he, I think he is a great essayist. Um, and that's why we're re really proud to have him in Notting Hill Editions. So um, thank you again, Douglas and Fisher, and thank you to the audience for, for listening. <laughs>